Hi everyone, welcome back to Learn with Gravaholic. My name is Marcus, and today I'm speaking to Kaylee Fritz. And here are some of the things that we will be talking about. I mean, the big one was just that, like, I was refusing to do what they wanted me to do. <laughs> and made a, like, 10-minute podcast, and, you know, the music was like, I played it on my daughter's xylophone, which is sitting right over here, and, like, <laughs> that's... <laughs> That that was that was the beginning. Basically, that's what I would focus on is is like mm. what's my thing? What 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 silly little blog can I start that ten people will read? But I don't care because I'm building expertise and I will have something to show. So Kayla Fritz is the editor in chief and co-founder of Escape Collective. He's been on an incredible journey. So bear with me. Here comes the whole interview. Hello and good morning, Kaylee. How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Nice chilly morning here in Durango. Yeah, Durango, California, California, Colorado. <laughs> That's a big difference, huh? That's kind of the cycling mecca, no? Have I realized, it's, or is that just a it, super? It's, it's kind of become one, and I, I think it's mostly notable for uh, for how small it is and how many riders it produces. It's, there's only about twenty twenty five thousand people that live here. And yeah, Sepkus. Everyone rides a mountain bike. Right? Everybody rides a mountain bike. <laughs> I mean, you know, like I, I'm, I'm sort of at the north end of town, and there's basically tr mountain bike trail systems. Like I could basically circumnavigate the town on on mountain bike systems. So not too super surprising that we create a lot of mountain bikers. And then there's a there's a junior program called Durango Devo that um, has 850 kids in it. Uh, so 850 kids in a town of 20,000, right? Like one in 20 people is, wow. is, is in, is in this, uh, this program. And so, yeah, not, not too surprising that we create Sepkus and Quinn That's Simmons awesome. and, uh, yeah, Chris Blevins, the, the, the short track world champ from, from last year, lots of talent coming out here. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. I am super stoked to have you and to join the show. I, I am beyond happy about this so thank you for joining yeah i'm <clears throat> i've been following you guys and, and and yourself for basically since i started cycling four or five years ago now and and i i got into cycling i started listening to podcasts and i immediately sort of started listening to to cycling tips mm -hmm. and what you guys did there and your your voice and your way to express yourself i i i, I just find it hilarious and it's become even better now in uh, in the era of escape well, collective you. i would say but let's, <laughs> i will get back to i will get back to that part i just need should i say congratulations did you get your second kid now yeah or? yeah no i'm i'm uh the, none of them are home right now which is why i'm sitting in, in my kitchen instead of in my in my i have a camper sitting outside that, that i use to escape the toddlers <laughs> um like a, like an okay. old like a 1960s RV that I've turned into an office. Anyway, that's why I'm in here. Awesome. Uh, yeah, we had our we had our second in uh, the beginning of December. So I'm just kind of getting back to work now, kind of. Um, you know, paternity leave isn't really a thing when you own the business, I find. I know. <laughs> so as much I as know. I would love to take a bunch of time off, uh, it just might not make any sense. Um, but yeah, I had, I had our second. He's doing well. Mom's doing well. So thank you. Congrats. Thank you very much. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, but let's. I I have so many questions. I don't know where to start, really. So I. I but let's let's just get going. I think one one thing that I'm curious about um, is really what the era that you're in right now. I want to call it an era because it's not a chapter; it's an era, basically, uh, with Escape Calyptic because it's just such a different thing that you guys have created. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's start. I want to start on a pain, pain, potential pain point. How how did you feel? I would presume it was a cold November day or night, November or even 15th, a morning. Morning, yeah. And twenty twenty two when you when you got that call or you got that email or whatever it was. Uh, uh yeah. On, on being, well, so how, how did that? How did you feel? What happened? So November, I think it was November fifteenth or sixteenth or something like that. I think it was fifteenth. I woke up and by the time I had woken up, my uh, Dan Benson in in the UK, who was the editor in chief of Vela News, had already been laid off. Um, and so, you know, word started to spread, right? I didn't actually hear it from Dan because yeah. he wasn't allowed to talk to me, but um, I, it had already spread, right? And uh, so, and then, then, you know, there was a there was a 15 minute meeting on my calendar uh, with my 
Mm. And I was like, here we go. <laughs> um, mm. I, you know, I, it wasn't a surprise to me. Um, I was kind of expecting it. I was sitting there, uh, you know, I, I turned to my wife and I was like, I'm pretty sure this is, this is it. Like, this is the day. I'm pretty sure this is the end of mm. my time at cycling tips. Um, and that felt weird that that was, I felt really sad to me. Uh, like I, 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 I won't pretend that I was happy about any of this stuff happening. It just wasn't surprising. Um, what, what, can you, can you tell me about what were the signs that you saw this potentially happening? Um, I mean, the big one was just that, like, I was refusing to do what they wanted me to do. <laughs> right. So, mm. so I was, I was, yeah, okay. I, like, I, I was, I was running cycling tips, you know, as the editor in chief of cycling tips. Right. And so it was my job to take the, the sort of strategy from, um, you know, from the, from the head of content and things like that. Um, and from, from, you know, Robin himself, the CEO, Robin Thurston, because uh, Robin's a, a avid cyclist and definitely had his, his fingers in, in cycling, uh, titles more so than for example like skiing or something right so kind of take that vision and 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 execute it right and um and the problem is i didn't like that vision and and none of my staff liked mm. that vision and um you know there's a reason so wade had left what was it like july or august or something previously like the writing was on the wall that that what we were doing was not what they wanted us to do um, mm. and I kind of had to make a decision, like, do I fall in line? Do I do the corporate thing? Do I try to climb that outside corporate ladder and, and, you know, pro probably be a lot more sort of secure in, in my own career, um, or basically put my foot down and be like, Oh, we're going to do what we want to do. And we'll see how long that lasts. And it turned out it lasted until middle of November. Uh, so that's yeah. why I wasn't surprised because like, to be perfectly honest, I was not doing a good job. Uh, as as determined by by you know my bosses right so um yeah i was obstinate and and just and just not doing what they wanted me to do so so there, there's a whole bunch of like sort of small things that that i could kind of point to but they're, they're not super relevant um but the sense was definitely just that you know the, the cycling tips vision of like what we wanted media to be and the outside vision of what they wanted cycling media to look like just didn't really line up. And there was a whole bunch of issues like how do you differentiate between us and Vela News and all these things like that that we just yeah, we just never saw eye to eye kind of kind of from day one. Um hmm. and I think it was inevitable at that point. Um, like I said, yeah. I don't I don't blame them. I also like if I was in their position and I've got cycling tips and I've got Vela News and you know, neither of them are making a huge amount of money. Uh, in fact, like maybe none at all. <laughs> um, like we were making money. I think Bell, Bell News is losing money. But you're looking at these two these two entities, and uh, you know what would you do with them? Like you, you you don't need both in the same portfolio, and so one of them's got to go. Yeah, yeah. from a business point of view, it's it's a quite a simple decision. Exactly, uh, exactly. So it, it's unfortunate, and I think it's it's you know, it's sort of a. a it's the spreadsheets ruling all right. And that's the sad yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I think we all ended up better off. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I was, I was really and sad about the end, but I wasn't surprised. And I, at this point can kind of look back on it and think positively on, on it, I think. And, and how and where was the, the idea of escape collective? Like that idea was born. Um, I, so, so Dave Rome and I, we actually, we meant to put something out on this and then I just had a crazy week. Um, it turned out in, in, in November this year, cause we were going to do a one year anniversary of the first podcast that Dave Rome and I made. Um, yeah. cause Dave, Dave got laid off the same day as me. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, again, I think it was like a day or two later, it was like November 17th. We just sort of, you know, booted up our laptops, our personal laptops, because our, our work laptops had shut off uh, and and made a like 10 minute podcast. And, you know, the music was like I played it on my daughter's xylophone, which is sitting right over here. And like that's that that was that was the beginning, basically. And and one of the things that um, one of the I, like literally one of the reasons why Escape now exists is because we made that podcast and thousands of people listen to the very first one, right? Like they followed yeah. us over basically. Yeah. And wow. And that for us was like, okay, well we do the math on that. 
if we're going to do, if we're going to you know, do a subscription membership kind of model, this number of people followed us within 36 hours, we can probably con hmm. convert a fair number of those into, into paying members. They, they clearly like what we do. And that was yeah. kind of the impetus to, to just start thinking about, okay, well, what does this actually look like? Uh, and, 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 you know, how do we make it happen? And what is the actual model and whatever else you start with? Okay. There's an audience we have, we think we, we know we can bring an audience with us. And then we went into the business side and, um, that's when Wade got back involved. Uh, cause Wade had just been, you know, he, I don't know what he was doing, hanging out in Melbourne for a couple months. Um, and yeah, we pulled Wade back in and started to have those conversations more deeply and started to like find some money. Uh, you know, we have a little bit of sort of friends and family investment to, to get us through launch and things like that. Uh, and started to, yeah, just conceive of the whole, the whole project. So it, it kicked off pretty quickly after, after we were laid off. And then it was really accelerated because, uh, there's basically a giant walkout at cycling tips, right? Yeah. Um, most, uh, most exactly. of the staff left in the, in the following sort of four to six weeks. And, um, you know, I was under a pretty strict non-solicitation clause. And so I couldn't actually go mm. and I couldn't actually go and tell people what we were doing or, or try to get them out. Mm. Um, they all left on their own volition, but once they were out the door, we could start pulling the thing together. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there's I have so many questions. I, I need to figure out which order I take them, but, um, I, I, you were speaking to, to one thing there now that, that, that I've been thinking about as well that I want to ask mm -hmm. you about you you and now it's funny because you you refer to it officially as members yeah. but now you you said it's like in what I want to ask you about like subscription versus members I think there's there is a slight difference right and and maybe it's just I'm I'm not a native speaker but I I, I think you you have maybe it's your vision as well sort of what you want to set out to create mm -hmm. um that is not sort of subscription based, but member based. I think that is something that speaks to me and like building the com a community mm -hmm. kind of feeling. What 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 goes into that from your side? So we think we think of Escape as a a community business, like if, from a business perspective. Ignoring the sort of like the editorial side, right? Which is um, for me like the editorial kind of draws the lines around around the community, right? Like this is, this is what we want to talk about. This is who we are. Um, but fundamentally it's a, it's a community business because, uh, you know, taken kind of very, if we do put ourselves in a kind of spreadsheet mode, right? People that are involved in a community are much more likely to, to be sticky as we, as we say, like they, they're, they're less likely to cancel. They're less likely to churn. Um, so as from a business perspective, having people who are, engage not only with us as editors and with our editorial, but also with each other is massive. It, it is, it's, it's, yeah. Like anybody who's on our discord, for example, I'm not worried about canceling in March when their renewal comes up. Right. Mm -hmm. And, or whenever their renewal does come up, but most of our members signed up in the first two weeks. So, so most that that's, yeah. that's our next sort of like cliff basically. Um, Yes. Yeah, so, so, so we think about it that way. And then the editorial is essentially, again, to, to sort of like define what the community is about and what the community likes and what the community stands for. Um, and, you know, pulls in, pulls in new people and, and gets them engaged and all the rest. But fundamentally, it's, it's about keeping, you know, thousands of people feeling like they're part of something. That's a much more powerful business than just trying to sell people's eyeballs to bike brands basically <laughs> which is not something yeah, that I mean, we really the, want to do yeah and and as you say the the, the the this speaks to the attrition speaks to the longevity of it mm -hmm. and, and and all so i really hope i mean i'm a proud founding member member i actually checked the webpage yesterday i searched for my name and i found it there so i'm super Still happy there. about that having Still there. Being there and i will continue being it as well yeah. to, to answer your um, your your specific question there so subscription and membership we definitely view differently right subscription is essentially a, tra yeah. it's a transaction it's like i want yeah. something i will pay to get it you know netflix right that's a subscription membership is definitely more of a two-way street and so you know not we know that not all of our members are going to view it that way some of them are just paying for the content and that is totally fine yeah. right that is absolutely mm -hmm. fine but we do want to make sure that we have the sort of space for like a true membership where 
where not only are we are we sort of sending things out to the world, but stuff's coming back to us, and we're using, you know, the the expertise that exists in our membership is is a thousand times more powerful than what we can have in in our little tiny group of, of editors, right? So like leaning on on people that have areas of expertise and yeah, making it a bit more sort of circular, I guess, um, than if if we were just you know let's just make a editorial product and ship it. I mean, and, and I love the approach. I actually never really heard about it, even outside of the industry, that that people do it in this kind of way, where you engage, you create. I mean, there's you could do it with other tools, right? Mm -hmm. Than Discord, you use Slack, whatever. But uh, you you choose Discord, and I've I've been on. I mean, I'm not a super active member, but I'm there, and and there's so much going on, so much conversation, so much experts, and but also the friendliness. I mean, mm -hmm. there's. This whole, it's like not being on, on, on internet because internet has a lot of trolls, a lot of bad people, yeah. a lot of sort of not speaking about Twitter, but I mean, <laughs> but this is just a sanctuary. Yeah. We, I mean, we, we, I think we have a lot of mods on discord that do a, an amazing job with that. They, they really kind of sort mm. of keep conversations pointed in the right direction. Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, we also kick people out. <laughs> like if, if, uh, okay. if you are just a, if you are a, a recurring problem, um, and, and by problem, I don't mean like, oh, you, you bring an opinion that we don't like or something like that. I mean, like you're trolling or you're just picking fights mm. or, or being insulting or whatever, like, you yeah. know, breaking our rules. Like our, we, we have, we have community guidelines, right? Um, yeah, we, we've, we've sort of, we've booted a couple people, uh, because you know, that, that stuff spreads like a virus. It really does. You know, it, you, yeah. it only takes one to kind of start to drag the whole vibe of a, of a community down and, and uh, yeah, to be perfectly honest, like, okay, we, we boot you out. We give you your hundred dollars back. Um, you know, we signed up 20 people yesterday. Like I, I, I will get that back as if, as long as I make sure, yeah. that they, as long as I make sure that the community is, is healthy and that that has to sort of like come above everything. So combination of really good moderation. And then as part of that, yeah, just making, making sure that people understand what the, what the place means and how to behave and, the fact that we're not going to allow sort of bad internet behavior hmm. in our space. Like it's, it's our, it's our workplace, right? Yeah. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't allow people to come into your office and just start screaming at you. <laughs> so well, that's, that's what I hate about internet sometimes. Yeah. It's just awful. Yeah. Uh, there's so, so much bad people out there yeah. and they just take advantage of the situation of, of just being able to shout out to, to everyone. Mm -hmm. It's just, Oh, Oh, let's leave that to the side. Um, so th now you're in a completely different ballpark, right? You, previously, you were working for the man, basically, more or less, yeah, right? Yeah. And and now and now you have the weight of your shoulders. I used to be a, a run a startup myself. Mm -hmm. I, I I employed people. I employed myself. And in order to really put food on the table, basically, you you, you had to deliver. You had to do good. You had to take care of your employees. Yep. How do you feel about having that weight on your shoulders now? <laughs> um, I underestimated it for sure. Uh, you know, Wade tried to tell me, right? Like Wade had had started Cycling Tips previously and had yeah. been through this before and had had the sleepless nights and the, the you know the times when you're not sure you're going to make payroll and 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 all that stuff. And yeah, like we've had we've had an incredible first year. So we're, we're coming up on a full year, right? We launched in the middle of March last year. It's been amazing. Like I, I it, it's at the upper edges of kind of what we predicted was possible, um, but it's still been incredibly difficult, right? And, mm. and, and we're still not profitable. That's another like, that's, that's, you know, like I said, we, we have a bit of sort of friends and family investment that's kind of get, gonna get us yeah. through this first year, but like we, we still need more members to get to a place where, where we are sort of fully self-sustaining. We're not that far off. Mm. Um, and we're sort of farther ahead than we maybe thought we would be, but that still hangs over you, right? The, the fact that, you know, there is a, there is an end to the runway. If we, if nothing changes mm. between now and I'm not gonna tell you when it is, <laughs> but there is an end to the runway. Right. And like, and you know, you see those spreadsheets and you see those numbers and it, it, it is, it's yeah. a very different feeling for sure um yeah it, it just a, a different level of of um well, of stress basically but at the same time like I said, but, things have gone pretty well so it could be a lot 
worse, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe maybe those potential sleepless nights or, or worries, they are sort of balanced with now the freedom and an independence that you have. Oh, 100%. All right. 100%. Yeah. And, and yeah, just being your own boss, which is cool, right? <laughs> like I've, 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 I've never, I've never done that before, right? Like I, I've always had a couple layers over my head and, and now, you know, big decisions that need to be made are essentially, uh, one, Wade and I don't have to make them on our own. We have a whole big crew that, that we make big decisions with now. It feels a lot more collaborative than it ever has before. Um, yeah, and we try to make sure that everybody feels like they have a say in, in those big calls, right? Like, you know, right now we're sort of looking at 2024 and we're saying, okay, well, we dabbled in cross country mountain bike last year and we, did a little bit of dabbling in gravel and like, what does, what does the next step look like for us? You know, what, what mm -hmm. do we feel like we've essentially kind of tapped the available kind of like hyper engaged paying audience, uh, for, for road cycling, do we need to start to, to look elsewhere and things like that? Those decisions, they're not just on my shoulders or Wade's shoulders. They're, they're on the whole crew. Um, we have these big sort of strategy calls where we, where we try to answer these questions for ourselves. Uh, yeah. So that, that is helpful. Like it's, it's not, it's not just a one man, a one man show or a two man show. Um, but it is different, you know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> I like. yeah it is definitely different, which it's, it's hard, it's hard to describe like in precisely what ways other than the fact that like, there's just no, there's no backstop, right? Like if, if we screw yeah. it up, it's on, it's on us. It's good and bad. But if we, I'm going to try to segue now, but take it a little bit more holistic, right? I mean, I mean, you were you were alluding to it now as well. Um, that what what part of that audience have you guys tapped into? And and I've been thinking about this as well, right? That cycling in general is a huge thing, like mm -hmm. across the world, cycling is huge. I mean, but then why is there? This is a multifaceted question now. But that, like you, what you were saying now your audience could be like basically the whole world mm. everyone because more or less everyone owns a bicycle not really but um and then in comparison to, to cycling media as well same thing goes for like pro cycling as well mm. it's so small in comparison to other sports why do you think that is um is it is it not attractive enough or what, what's, well, what, what, mean, what's your thing i mean the number the numbers are big Sorry, I'm going to turn on do not disturb here because my wife keeps texting me something about groceries. <laughs> um, <laughs> nothing particularly important. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the numbers can be big, right? Like, like um, in the cycling tips days, and even back to when I was working at Velo News, um, when you know, when Facebook was sending a lot of traffic and when Google was at its finest and, and when we had all these ways of dis of distribution that, that have actually kind of started to fall apart in the last like two years, um, you know, a good story was one that got, that got six figure page views, right? You know, 100,000, mm. 200,000, 300,000 page views. Uh, that's a lot of people, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. unique unique visitors to the site in the millions in, in, a, in a given month, um, you know, in, in like high millions during the Tour de France, right? Like th there are big, big, big audiences out there. Uh, a lot of those people though are pretty casual. I think they're kind of pass throughs, right? And, you know, they show up because they Googled something or they show up because Google news showed them something or they show up because Facebook showed them something, but they're not really sort of hyper engaged to the point where, they're going to pay us, you know, eight, nine, 10 bucks a month, depending on which level he, you, you pick to engage with what we're doing. Right. There's, there's, there's not as many of those people. I think, I, I, I still think there's a lot out there. Um, particularly if you start to look into other spaces, like I said, we're primarily kind of like road ish driven at this point in time, but definitely have plans to, to go a lot wider than that. Once you start to add these other kind of niches within cycling, the, the, the available audience gets a lot bigger. But yeah, I, the, basically what we're talking about is, is, a, is a pretty fundamental shift in the way that you think about media too, because for the mm -hmm. last 10 years, longer than that even, you know, you could call it like the scale era, right? Where 
suddenly there were all these tools to put your content in front of so many people than you could before. So like I said, Facebook, Google, Twitter, like all these things, they, they were enormously powerful and they basically took, you know, what your, what your audience would normally be and they, and they multiply it by a hundred or a thousand. Uh, you know, these are the days of, of BuzzFeed and BuzzFeed News and, and all these sort of things that we're getting. Oh, we did a billion page views this month, like that sort of crazy, crazy, crazy mm. numbers. You know, Facebook and Google and they, they've all kind of turned off the taps in the last two years. And a lot of that reach has been decreased. And so, you know, you look at um, some of the big players, you know, the Condé Nast and the Hearst and things like that. And, and, you know, their traffic is down 20% year over year, like that, that, that kind of pretty nasty declines. Um, and I'm pretty convinced that that, that sort of scale era is over and, and you monetize that differently than you monetize a small audience, right? You monetize a big audience by basically just chucking as many people at a page as you possibly can, putting ads on it, trying to get a little micro scent out of each one of them. When you go smaller and, and narrower, which is where we are right now, partially due to this sort of like turning off the taps thing, but also just because of, of what our, where our model sits, you know, I don't need that many people to read a story mm. for it to be successful. I would, mm. in fact, I would rather a smaller group of people read a story and feel strongly about it than a larger group of people read a story and just kind of pass through. Right. Because yeah. the pass throughs, they don't they don't do anything for me. I don't monetize them in any way. Right. We don't have any ads on the page. So I don't I get zero cents for people that just show up once and leave. The only the only usefulness of that is, you know, maybe they become a, a, a regular reader at some point. But you, you convert a vanishingly yeah. small percentage of those people. But if I get a couple thousand people that are really stoked on something to the point where they're willing to, to sign up to be a, a member, that is way more valuable to me, right? Like we can run this entire business on, you know, depending on exactly what we do with budgets and like how quickly we expand. It's like, it's somewhere between 10 and 20,000 members, right? Um, to be fully sustainable, profitable, like comfortable, right? That's not that many people in the grand scheme of do the you, internet. Do you see your content creation then kind of as your advertisement? Yeah. That's exactly what it is. So, 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 I mean, like, again, to, 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 to like, to put it really cynically, and again, this isn't like kind of really how we think about it. Cause we like making content. We like being journalists. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Like we, we, we do this because we enjoy it and, and it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's our, we have a huge passion for it. But if you take it very cynically, the content is basically like the honeypot for attracting people, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And you pull them mm -hmm. in and you, mm -hmm. and you get them stuck and they like it and they realize that they're getting something that they can't get anywhere else, which is one of the real key things. Hopefully maybe they get involved in our community. They're getting involved in discord. They're just, maybe they're just in the comment section, like whatever it is, but the, the content is what attracts them. Then we try to keep them around and then hopefully, you know, we get your eight bucks a month or whatever, right? Because this yeah. is fundamentally, it is still a business and you know, I'm paying 15 people mm. a salary, like payroll is, 90% of my annual costs, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, so we, we, we need those people's money. And if we, we have to sort of think about it a little bit cynically every once in a while, because you have to, you, know, you have to sort of work in, in the reality there. Uh, but yeah, that, that's, the, that's essentially the way that it functions now. And, and the big difference is that you can now build an entire media company off the back of 10 to 20,000 people. Whereas mm. if you're using the old scale model, a 10,000, you know, a, 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 a post that gets 10,000 views is useless. That made you like $3, <laughs> right? <Yeah. Like, laughs> it doesn't do anything. So it's, it's a completely different way of thinking about, yeah, about your audience and about the way that you basically are like extracting money out of a, out of a group yeah. of people. Uh, again, yeah. to put it, to put it very, very cynically underneath all that is the content has to be worth paying for. So that's like, yeah. that's where we talk about how, um, with our model, the incentives align, right? The incentives, if you're in a scale model is to just make a lot, the incentives, if you're in a niche, I only need 10, 20,000 people model is to make something very good. And so yeah. that's why we like our model.
because we get to make good stuff. Yeah. We don't have to make a lot of yeah, a exactly. lot of crap, basically. Hey, quality over quantity. Exactly. It's, um, yeah, I have. It's. I think we're. I'm, it's not the first time actually in in my series now that people or someone gets to that point mm. where we're sort of heading into that direction where so I, I as you say there is something to it where you say well, the, with that scale era is sort of disappearing in one way yeah. and we want to find more quality rather than just having all that i mean and I can somewhat relate to it as well myself from my little Instagram thingy that I'm have going on right now. That mm. and this whole thing with the chasing of new content and and trying to get reach, and it's kind of and this is bad to say as well, right? Or I don't know if it's bad to say, but but it's that sort of meaningless kind of content that gets the reach. Yep. That's that's it's not the most is more time is not the, the quality stuff so like that gets the reach it's it's the it's the ridiculous kind of um, you're feeding the algorithm things and and, and, the, and the things that doesn't give me the most and that's what i think it's so sad when I, now i'm going to do a little bit of introspection here but when i want when i post things that i really like yeah. <clears throat> there's limited reach mm -hmm. limited audience but then I, I do things where i know okay this is a crowd pleaser it's it's gonna work yep. it is working it's mm. Yep. So I've been I've been talking to myself about this many times. Like, which you, Marcus, you need to you need to choose. Like, either you go one way or you do the other. It's like, and and one 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 thing that I did due to that is actually starting this this kind of conversations mm -hmm. because I wanted to talk to people. I wanted to do things that that I feel good about that that has much more quality to it. That that also gives people something more value yeah. than just meaningless quotes or yeah, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, I mean. I, I hate, I hate algorithms. I hate them. Like mm. they're, they're, they're useful because they provide reach and they maybe put you, your work in front of people who wouldn't otherwise find it. And like, they, they can be useful, right? But they incentivize exactly what you're talking about, which is they incentivize, okay, I know this works. I don't like it, but I know it works. Let's do it. Right. And like you, you can basically, if you just sort of peel back the layers of the internet onion for the last 10 years, and you're like, why is the internet getting worse and worse and worse? It's because we're all trying to trick Google or TikTok or Instagram into putting our stuff in front of people. And mm. the reality is that, is that, you know, that, that incentive exists if you're paid off of off of volume, right? If you're paid off of the volume of people that are seeing it, the number of eyeballs that you're getting in front of it, if that's the way that you're paid, then you're incentivized to, yeah, to feed the algorithm basically. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, and Instagram certainly likes that because they want yeah. other people to be engaged. That's how they make their money. Right. Uh, again, we are trying to kind of flip that on its, on its head a little bit because we just don't need the, that volume of people we need hyper engaged people and yeah that means that that we're just not particularly algorithm focused right like we we no. we don't we actually don't do that much social media <laughs> like we we should do more we 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 that's actually one of our things for 2024 is to kind of start to open the top of the funnel as, as we say like find find new people that have never heard of us before which are, of which there are still a lot um but yeah, like for us, it's all about that small group of people that are that are really really into it. And again, small in yeah. the sort of in this in the relative to the millions of people that used to come to to cycling websites. Yeah, um, yeah, the, the right niche. You want the right people, yeah. right? You want the ones that, that appreciate what you guys do, and and that's that's yeah. understandable. I, I think that media in the last ten years, we kept trying to compare ourselves to tech companies. Right. In terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you're, mm -hmm. you're, that's why we wanted the millions and millions and millions. Cause essentially what we're trying to do is, is, well, everyone's running off of programmatic advertising and, and you needed that volume to, to make the, the finances work. But it's just like, now we're just like a store, right? Like I'd rather compare myself to a store down the street than Google <laughs> because mm -hmm. I can, Google is such a, it's the, the scale is so far beyond anything that we could ever sort of even truly comprehend. 
Whereas if I compare myself to a store, if I've got if I've got fifteen thousand like avid customers at a store, that's a really good business, right? Yeah. And that's more where we need to what we need to think about. Like I, I it, it it's hard. It it, it um, like I was chatting with Ian Trellor about this recently, and we've had some. I think some of the staff feel like, oh, like I write these stories and they get, they get, you know, they get fewer people reading them than back in the cycling tips days, which is true. And it would be true mm-hmm. again, e- even if we, even if we're all still at cycling tips, everything's just dropping anyway, but we're a new entity. And so like, you know, our SEO is does good and all the rest of these things, like the, 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 the numbers are just smaller. And anyway, we're having this conversation and he found it kind of demoralizing that the numbers weren't as big as they were before. And we really had to rethink, yeah. we're like, okay, let's rethink what actually a good story looks like. A good story might have a smaller page views number, but it's got 60 comments on it. So 60 people, mm-hmm. 60 people, which is a lot of people bothered yeah. to put their thoughts on this thing, right? That's a successful story for us now, as opposed to just a, you know, oh, I got 150,000 page views. They made us, exactly. made us $12 whatever <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i got a little random speaking there, about but... speaking, <laughs> about the type, speaking about the type of content that you guys create now and the freedom like i i love that straightforward and simple piece that you did on your kids bike mm. or bikes such a great piece i mean i've i've never seen anything like that i mean from it, it was just brilliant well thank you <laughs> it was pretty yeah. simple to put together i was just but honestly, the, the the impetus for that was I had all the bikes lined up, uh, like in my garage, and I was like, I should just, I should just put the post up because I think I'd put something on Instagram previously that was like, this is what my kid has done over the last because she's, she turns three in April, so we're kind of like mm-hmm. we're about to sort of get on to she's kind of done a little bit of pedal bike, so she's done the whole thing, and Instagram just filled with people like other young parents just being like this is the best thing ever. Like I'm going to go buy all four of these bikes, <laughs> just be ready to go. I was like, yeah, oh, I should just put it on the, on the website, which is about, yeah, was... yeah. We often do that. We, I often sort of like tease. Um, I do the same thing with the Tour de France. Uh, and I have for years where <laughs> back when Twitter was like a, a useful tool, which it isn't really anymore. <laughs> I would just send a bunch of tweets out near the end of the race and whatever one got retweeted the most, I'd write that story. Right, like <laughs> that. Was, it's it. Sometimes, sometimes the world just tells you what you're supposed to be doing, and you just need to listen. That's smart. That's use of validation. That's what I work yeah. with. Barshley. That's awesome. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. No, and um, it, switch gears a little bit. You, you're um, you use your cargo bike a lot, right? Yeah. It's. Uh, I have one too. Not not as nice as yours, but uh, tell me how how did you come about getting that idea to use a cargo bike and, and um, uh... well so so uh my neighbor so we live in durango now but i lived in boulder colorado for a long time and my neighbor in boulder um actually ran an, an e-bike shop in boulder uh front range cargo mm-hmm. bikes ryan uh, and ryan was awesome and he actually he was like the only colorado-based importer of those urban aero bikes and so he kind of was the one that was like hey we need to get you on one of these things. And then James Wong had one. Um, and it just looked like the most fun. And basically as we, you know, we're, we're looking at, at being parents, had our daughter in April, ordered it up, got the bucket bike in September. Um, it, it, you know, it fits a, a like a car baby seat in there. So you can put a, a real mm-hmm. small infant in. And um, that was, well, my daughter's about to turn three. So it was about two years ago now. Uh, and we've got 5,000 miles on that thing. So what's that? Eight, eight, 8,000 kilometers wow. on a bucket bike, uh, almost entire, like three miles at a time, right? F- sorry. I'll, I'll talk in case 5k at a time, uh, you know, here to grandma's back every single day, drop the kid off. Cause, uh, my wife's uh, mother does, does childcare for us. Um, oh. yeah. So every single day, just, you know, 8,000 kilometers, 5K at a time. Boop, 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 boop. That's fantastic. <laughs> and we love it. Cause, That's I mean, our only other vehicle is a, is a big, stupid American truck, um, mm-hmm. and which we use for, like, it's got a camper on it, and it, we use for big adventures, and otherwise we basically don't touch it. Um, you know, it'll sit for four to six weeks at a time while we just use the bucket bike to get around. 
I love it. It's it's we've got studded tires on it for the winter here because winters are pretty pretty nasty yeah. here. Um, yeah, it is. It's just freeing, you know. Like if you wake up in the morning, yeah. uh, you got to take your kid. My my kid. Go ahead. My kids love mine as well. They they just they they think it's fantastic. Yeah. They it's, you can bring stuff. You go to the beach. for us. We can go to the beach or and it's just yeah yeah it's amazing. Such a nice vehicle. You yeah I love yeah, it. Yeah, you you wake up in the morning and you've got to take your kids somewhere and you know you just don't want to pack up the car. You don't want to go fight traffic. You don't want to do any like it's just it's you know all that stuff sucks. And then you get on the bike, you get a little like for me it's like it's like. 15 minutes each way. So I get a little half hour spin in the morning and mm. like, what a, what, just what a great way to start your day, you know? And, and we're, yeah, we're, we're pretty lucky. Like the infrastructure is decent here. It's not a big town. So like, it's not, I just avoid like the one busy road <laughs> but, <laughs> and everywhere else is pretty chill. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I highly recommend them to anybody. Um, yeah. I, there's, they've, 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 so when we first moved here, we were the only ones with a, one of the big sort of Bachfeets style uh, bikes. And now there's four urban arrows in town. Uh, we keep seeing them multiply. So we like to think that we have, that we've inspired people to, to do that. Definitely. And I run into people all the time who I've never met before in my life, but they see me on the bike and they're like, Oh yeah, I've seen you cruising around town. It's like, again, it's a small town. You know, everybody's probably seen me at some point in that thing. And it certainly stands out in a, in a Southwest mm -hmm. American town without a whole lot of that stuff going on. <laughs> It's probably more like European thing, or I would I would guess so because yeah. everyone drives their car, and the infrastructure is to say it's not as as accommodating in in oh, North sure. America, I presume. Yeah, um, yeah, we've got sort of yeah, we've got so there's a big river that runs through town here, and there's a river path um, that you know it's kind of like a main artery if you're on a bike, so it works pretty well. But yeah, mm -hmm. if, if I was if I lived in most other places in the United States, it would not be as useful of a vehicle. Um, yeah. Which is a shame, yeah. Which is a real shame. But I, I actually, I was interviewing. Um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Eric, who's True Marmalade on Instagram. I don't know if you follow him. Um, no, he, I don't. So he, I need to check he him had out. the most uh, unique miles of anybody uh, that uses that Wanderer dot Earth thing for that, like that's yeah, yeah. So he he rode. It was like 29,000 unique kilometers last year on a, on a 200 pound cargo bike. No, no e-assist whatsoever. Just, just, just him. Um, fascinating guy. <clears throat> anyway, that story will be up on the site sometime in the next week or so, but uh, um, yeah. Definitely going to check out that so, piece. <laughs> but he, he, so he kind of proved that you can, you know, you can, you can't get around the U S with, with one of these things, but he's also like had some close calls and yeah, he's uh he's become pretty fanatically anti-car <laughs> so which is yeah. surprising if you're going to go live in a car for for a year or whatever. for the sake of the environment we should all be right uh in one way or another yeah. <laughs> but that's that's a big debate yeah i mean well <laughs> the cargo bike a little bit is like a little bit of guilt around this stupid truck that we have right like my truck gets like 13 miles the gallon or something like that <laughs> like i just i feel bad every time i'm in it <laughs> so so what you what is it called uh, climate compensating no is yeah, it, what uh, is it called definitely, like definitely climate compensating <laughs> but yeah i watched i watched or listened to some i think it was and maybe it was a podcast I, you don't watch that many documentaries i think it was a podcast and this whole it's a kind of a big hypocrisy to be honest the whole the countries can buy and sell these kind of yeah. climate conversation whatever it's to me it's yeah ridiculous, but the, yeah it's a big hoax yeah like <laughs> unfortunately i have to fly a fair amount right for work and and i've always wondered like should i be purchasing the carbon credits that you know that united offers like is that something is that something that we should do like as a business, like what should I just write that mm -hmm. into my budget and say like, okay, whenever anybody flies anywhere, we purchase these carbon credits. I honestly personally don't know enough about it to know whether that's like just bullshit or not. Uh, but I should find out. I, this is, here's a perfect example. Like I'm sure I'm a hundred percent sure that there are people in our membership that can answer that question for me. Uh, yes. In fact, I know that like the, 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 the circular cycling, the Dutch, Dutch fellow, I'm forgetting his name now. I've, interviewed with him before but i'm just blanking um 
he's one of our members, right? So he can answer that question for me. There's a perfect example of like, mm. we, we sometimes have these questions about the business itself and we go to the membership and say, hey, like we need an expert in this. We need a designer, we need yeah. a lawyer, we need a <laughs> we need a whatever else. Yeah. And and you know, the community kind of rallies and it's it's really cool. Like that's something that I've never experienced. How business. how how um uh how active are you in the community and and uh, on Discord? Um I should be more active in Discord. I'm I'm pretty active in the in the placeholder podcast channel. Um mm-hmm. and I'm active during like in some of the live racing channels during during races for sure. Um uh, mm-hmm. I should be more so though. I mean, honestly, I'm just a, a two children under three in a business. <laughs> I just don't have a lot of time. <laughs> Tell me about it. I, I'm the same situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just don't have a lot of time uh, to just like hang out in chat rooms. And, and like where where I could see myself, like like I you know the weight weenies forum, for example. Yeah. Back when I was younger. And I was just like hanging out and as a as a fellow news tech editor, right? Uh, like I just I would just spend like all day hanging out in the way we use forum, chatting with people. If if anybody out there can figure out who what my old handle was, kudos to you. Uh, I, I haven't posted in a very long time, but yeah, like I would just hang out because I was I was working in an office and you know I just had this downtime in between stories that I had to write, and I would just sit on there and I would chat. My life has changed <laughs> since, since then. <laughs> I don't I don't have I don't have. Yeah, those gaps are filled with other things now, but I should be better at it. We we have um yeah, I think the tech guys are particularly good about getting in there. Uh and mm. people tag me and stuff all the time and I always try to respond. Yeah. But uh yeah. Yeah. I, but at the same time like like I said it's valuable for the editors to be in that space, but it's even more valuable if people are just interacting with each other and you know, they're yeah. making friends and and they're 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 making connections and if we can just be kind of like the hub for that great that 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 works for me yeah. that's that's perfect exactly but i haven't checked now if there was any um discussions after your last oh. episode on place orders you you guys spoke about this whole sort of potentially changing the pro cycling peloton with it becoming more like the football oh, kind the of, transfer season or, stuff. i would say i would have to say soccer then because so everyone <laughs> understands what i'm saying um um, that with this whole trading and mm-hmm. uh, the potential silly season, like and b- people being able to break contracts and and um, what I mean, I I used to be a big big soccer fan, mm-hmm. and, but ultimately the, the the last thing that kept me going to any of those news pages and reading it was actually the silly season stuff right. and, and the rumors that came to be the rumor mill. Yep, but then. Now, when I think about it and how you guys also addressed it in your conversation, you you kind of did it. Okay, well, we talk about this now and then we then you just left it there. But you could have spent the whole episode just doing that. And it just becomes, and now it comes back to what we talked about earlier. It's almost like clickbait yeah. because people are, are interesting in sort of how you guys reason, what you guys think, and how you guys sort of, there is other that do that other, I guess, more sort of more hypothesizing about things. Um, uh, but you guys, you're a bit more fact-based to that extent, I would say. But how do you feel about the, the first question to, towards that? Well, how do you feel about the cycling, pro cycling peloton moving towards that direction potentially? I mean, like as a as a media person, I love it, right? Like it, it it's just that you know we have a it's pretty slow between about like the end of the Vuelta and TDU. It's pretty darn slow. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. we some, I think we do a lot of our best work in that time because we have to get creative, but you know, it's, it's, you're scraping the barrel sometimes for, for stuff to write about. So from that perspective, I would love it. Right. And we're not really currently set up to do that particularly well. Um, like Dan Benson, who we were talking about in that, in, the, in that episode, the, the editor in chief over at GCN now, like he's very well sourced. He he loves that stuff. He digs on it all year, and and you know he's set up well for for that kind of space. We don't have, um, like we don't spend a lot of time and energy trying to break that kind of news. Uh, and of anybody on staff, I'm probably the best source to, to go do that, be, just because I've been mm-hmm. around for a really long time and I've been you know one of my fourteen tours to France or something like that. Um, and half it's just knowing people, right? Knowing mm-hmm. agents, exactly. knowing knowing former writers, knowing directors, et cetera. Uh, yeah. You know, classic, classic old school reporter stuff. So yeah, I, I think it'd be fun. I think like I would be, the chaos would be fun from a media perspective, from a, like a, a health of cycling perspective. I'm not sure we really need it. Um, 
you know, I, I, I think the potential for things to go sideways, particularly for the, the riders who aren't big stars kind of goes up in that scenario. Um, but I also think that, and I, I think I mentioned this in the podcast based off of a, and I hadn't actually put this together until we were actually talking about it on the podcast, but I was chatting with a, a agent like a month or two ago. Um, and they're certainly into this because the agents would make more money. And so generally if, if, if powerful figures within cycling and the agents are pretty powerful, see an yeah, opportunity. To, uh, you did mention this. Yeah. See an opportunity to make a bunch more money. <laughs> then mm -hmm. that thing is more likely to happen. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise yeah. me in the slightest if, uh, yeah, if things start to go, start to go that direction. I think the UCI would have to set some rules and whatever else. And frankly, like, UCI doesn't really have the capacity to manage something like this in the way that like the premier league does or, 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 or well, yeah. if it doesn't really do it, but yeah. Um, as a long answer to basically say, I think it'd be fun, but it probably, mm -hmm. it would probably have some, some downsides to the actual individuals involved. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's probably it, right? Because I think I would enjoy it too. Yeah. Uh, but it is probably not super good for the teams, probably not super good for the individuals, for the writers. Yeah. And I mean, they now it's a little bit easier, more straightforward, uh, the more gentleman agreement. I don't break a contract. We, yeah, easier for everyone. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. It's a big potentially shift that's happening, right? Yeah. Yeah. And again, it'd be the agents that are driving it for sure. Cause they're the ones that'll benefit. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Ah, we'll keep an eye on it. To shift, to shift gears a little bit. Um, I usually talk to, to, to people on, on my show about if they can help others do something similar to what you have done. Mm -hmm. Like you have had a successful journalist, um, <clears throat> career. You've done tremendous things amazing stories and everything is there any tips and tricks or guidelines or things to for people that would that are uh, aspiring journalists mm. out there and that, that that you could sort of help to guide it's hard um yeah i, I was i was just doing some sort of back of the napkin math recently on the number of available cycling journalism jobs compared to when I first started. Mm. So when I first started, uh, my first like full-time gig at Bella News was in, I think it was the end of 2010. Um, yeah, because my first tour was 2011. And, you know, at that point there were, well, there was Vela News. There was the sort of the, the nascent cycling tips. There, you know, big, strong cycling weekly. Ruler was massive at that point because um, it was just getting kicked off the ground by Rafa. and there was pro cycling mag like there's a, there's a whole bunch of entities that have actually completely ceased to exist since then mm -hmm. and we've lost probably somewhere in the neighborhood of like 30 to 40 percent of of the available sort of media jobs within within cycling um i, I should say within specifically like pro european road cycling right which is which was sort of like the the hub of where the actual work was for a long time i think that we've probably added some in kind of the gravel space and things like that. You know, um, I look at folks like Ben Delaney, who's, who's kind of making it work with YouTube and, and, uh, yeah. and stuff like that. Can people kind of go in their own way? So it's, it's, it does, things just shift around, but it is no question to like, to take the, the pathway I took, which was, I was an intern at Melanie's. I got a part-time actually Ben, uh, was the editor in chief at the time, hired me part-time worked my way to full-time, worked my way up the ladder at Bella News until the point where I felt like I basically topped out, jumped to cycling tips, kind of, you know, did the whole career thing. Uh, that is harder and harder for sure. My, I guess my, my suggestion would be to just start your own thing and try to do really good work, right? Uh, you know, when I, when I look around, and I'm, and I'm looking at hiring somebody and, and, you know, there's a, there's a, certainly a, a scenario that in 2024, we hire somewhere, somewhere between two and four people. So I'm already starting to look at, at some of those. Um, some of them were roles we wanted to actually hire for last year, but couldn't just for financial reasons. Uh, mm. You know, when, when I look around a resume is great, you know, a couple clips, uh, a couple you know, examples of your work are great, but really I'd rather see, 
like you covered a beat for a year and you built your own audience. Um, mm. Because, you know, the, 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 the use of the word collective in our name is not accidental in that we very much view it as this is the place where you come to get access to all these great writers and podcasters and, and whatever else. And it's really like author forward. It's why we have bylines on the homepage. It's why we have photos of people up. Like we really want you to get to know the people that are creating the content for you because that personal connection is also good for us from a business perspective. Right. Uh, yeah. So like when I, when I look to hire, I want you to have a niche already carved out for yourself, a beat already carved out for yourself that, that you're, that you're super passionate about. Um, you know, Ronan or, or Dave Rome, for example, are the two sort of easiest ones to point to, I think, where they've got this thing where they have basically become like the world's leading expert in something or just like the world's most passionate person about it, person about it. Like yeah. Dave Rome is probably the world's leading expert in random bike tools. Right. And you wouldn't think that that mm -hmm. is a. Uh, uh, there's a whole much of a, much of a business case around that, but there actually is because you only need, again, to, to get back to what we were originally talking about, you only need a small group of people to be really into something to basically cover that person's salary, right? Like I need, I need a thousand people to cover like any particular writer's salary, give or take. Uh, some will be more expensive, yeah. some will be cheaper, but you know, roughly a thousand people. Like that's not that many. If you, if you, consider like the number of people that follow you on Instagram, <laughs> right? Like, could you, could, yeah. could you convert a thousand people to paying? Probably. Right. Yeah. So you start to do that math. Um, mm -hmm. But to do that, you have to have that really specific, like, this is the thing that I am known for. And mm -hmm. I think that if I was, if I was 20, 20, 22 years old, trying to break into this space just out of college or whatever, that's what I would focus on is, is, like, mm. what's my thing? What, 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 what silly little blog can I start that 10 people will read, but I don't care because I'm building expertise and I will have something to show, uh, to, to a potential hire. Right. So basically you're pitching, pitching Wade's idea from way back when with cycling tips, huh? Not too far <laughs> off, not too far off. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, the the era of the blog is back right like that's what substack has yeah. done i mean substack is going through some other things at the moment with nazis and things uh so we maybe won't go into that too much but uh you know that like that's what the substack era has shown us is that people can build entire businesses entirely off of their own yeah. their own work right and if i'm mm -hmm. gonna go if i'm gonna go hire somebody it's a much less risky proposition for me if you bring an audience Right. So, yeah. so if you've already got, I'm, I'm just, I'm using you as a royal, you, not you specifically, Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you've got, if you've got 20,000 Instagram followers and a thing that you are known for, like that's, that, that's such an easy call for me because again, yeah. I'm pretty sure you can convert a certain portion of those people and pay your salary yeah. like that. Right. Yeah. That's, 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 that's my, that's my, Oh, that's, that's super cool. That, yeah. that makes sense. Where, I mean, being a, now I would call you a content creator. Maybe you don't appreciate that. I could call you a journalist <laughs> instead, but how you need, still need inspiration, right? Then you, I get, how, how do you stay motivated and where do you draw your inspiration from? Mm. Um, I mean, I write a lot less than I used to. Um, and I'm pretty picky about what I, what I chase down. Um, I write a lot less than I used to because, you know, you call me a journalist. I, I would call myself like a spreadsheet monkey at this point. Like I, I basically, <laughs> you know, like KPIs and, you know, oh, yay, yay. Uh, I would love to just get back to writing. Maybe I will at some point down the line, but um, for me, it's all about, it's all about change. So, so like one thing I personally do is I, I literally don't ride a bike from about November until like end of February. Um, I maybe do like a time bit of Zwifting, but I mostly cross country ski and I love it. And like mm -hmm. I, I race and, and, you know, I, I get that sort of like the same drive to train and to, you know, improve myself and, and like sort of the technical aspects are really fun. Like anybody who's into Nordic skiing knows that you can basically spend your entire life thinking about wax. Uh, and 
you know, all that stuff. And, and it kind of just shifts my brain into something. There's other of your colleagues that do that too. But that's very true. I actually, I wanted to, I wanted to, to uh, send some like high-end ski wax to Dave and see if it was fast on a chain. Um, <laughs> except it's really expensive. High-end ski wax is like a little block for like 150 bucks. So maybe, maybe not. Uh, wow. Anyway, I like to sort of take my myself out of of like hardcore race space, uh, cycling space for a little bit of time every year. And, mm -hmm. and that kind of helps me like once the season starts to kick off, you know, which yeah, TDU's on right now, Aussie crew pretty much has that handle, but I'm talking like when we get to on loop and, and, and all those sort of fun classics in the spring, like I am just champing at the bit to, to watch bike racing and talk about bike racing and ride my bike and, and all those things. So for me, it's about taking a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a, a hiatus uh obviously i have to yeah. i have to continue making bike content <laughs> throughout that time but like that's that's when you'll see me chasing down you know this guy eric who does crazy things on his cargo bike and 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 whatever else um mm -hmm. yeah i think that um i think that people and this is a bit this is a bit weird to i think kind of like say out loud but like journalism reporters writers we definitely like part of the draw of the job is how public it is right like you get a little dopamine hit when you write a story and people comment on it and tell you it's great and tell you that they love it like where else do you get that i mean if 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 you're working in a in a in a you know some company where you, your your work is in public right your work is just behind the scenes you would you never get that so it, it's a blessing and a curse for sure mm. because if you're if people don't like your stuff they they call your names and they're they're rude and and you know people can be real assholes but you know mm. if 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 you if they do like your stuff it's yeah it's it's like one of the best it's the best feeling in the world right to like to to put your mm. to put your work out into the world and have people dig it is an addictive feeling and so I think that that's a big part of the reason, honestly, I think that's a big part of the reason why so many people stick it out in this line of work when every objective measure of this job sucks, right? <laughs> like pay is bad. The hours are long. The, you know, like all, all these things, there's like most, most of the, most of the escape staff could probably go find a marketing job somewhere, make twice as much money, work, you know, 30% less and have a pretty, pretty good life, but their name wouldn't be attached to the things that they were making in public. Right. And mm. there, there is something, yeah. again, I think literally addicting about that. And so for me, I, mm. I never have any, I never have any problem with, uh, with sort of motivation on that front or, or like the, the, the desire to write things because you want to put your work out in the world and get that feedback and get that dopamine hit. And like, yeah, it's, 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 it's the reason why we all stick around, I think, which again, is a bit weird to like talk about it in terms of like literally an addiction to, to, to whatever it is, but that's the way that I've always sort of framed it in, in my head. I love the honesty, <laughs> honesty and transparency. I never thought about it like that. I mean, I, I, I do recognize myself in that from being sort of a content creator yeah. and, and even in my pro professional work as well, like being on stage or presenting something and you get that immediate feedback. That's that's that dopamine kicking exactly. in. So I, I do I do get where you, I, I do understand where you're coming from with that. So last question, when did you last have that dopamine sort of kick? Uh, and what triggered it? When was the last? I, I haven't written my. I've been I've been on leave, <laughs> so um, I would say that the last time I really had that was when we were covering the sort of like Yumbo Visma, Sepkus Roglic chaos around the Vuelta. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I broke a couple stories on on that, and and um, stuff that people said was wrong that turned out to be correct. Uh, like Ruglitch was going to leave and, and some other things. Um, that's a good, that's a good hit <laughs> when, 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 yeah, hit. when you're, when you're well-sourced and you're like, I know this is true. And I know the rest of the world doesn't know yeah. it yet, but I'm, and I'm going to write yeah. the story and I don't really care whether people tell me I'm wrong or not, because in four weeks, they're going to see that I was correct. Uh, that's a, that's a good, that's a good hit. I guess the other one would be the um, related to that. That the I wrote a story from the Sepkus parade 
here in Durango um, mm -hmm. that I just liked as a piece, right? As, as a piece of writing, I really, I really, I yeah. liked putting that one together and people seemed to appreciate it. And that was much more of the sort of like, you know, like who doesn't like people telling you that you're great? And people were telling me I was great exactly. in the and comment I love, section. I, <laughs> and I was like, this is great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, I love that piece too, actually. <laughs> Thank you. I love that piece too. Yeah, like that's, that's, that's what I mean is, you know, like, yeah, how do you turn that down, right? Like, how do you turn yeah. how do you turn down putting your work out in the world and people just being like, you're awesome. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's a perfect way to end this now. And just to say, uh, Kaylee, thank you very much. You are awesome. And, <laughs> and, and I, I, with many, with me, would say that we really appreciate what you've done, putting your sort of neck out there and, and being as brave as you and the others has been to to create escape collective and then keep that going thank you because you are a fresh breath to the cycling media and um, yeah we appreciate you appreciate you so thank you thank you very much we are trying um yeah thanks for having me on i love i love chatting about this stuff apologies for some of the like deep media studies nonsense but that's it's, it's where my brain is these days so <laughs> i love it <laughs> yeah and, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Kaylee. Have a nice day. Well, I am super impressed by Kaylee. It's incredible how much knowledge that he has, the way that he does it, and the way that he composed his team, and the way that they do everything that they do. If you haven't, check out escapecollective.com. Do subscribe, become a member of the collective. It is super fun to be part of that journey that they're on right now listening to all the different podcasts that you get um, access to, but also the community that they have is incredible. So join. See you.